Shalom from Israel to all of the Daystar viewers around the world. I'm Moshe Bartzvi, the producer and founder of Israel Now News. We at Israel Now News are dedicated to bringing you the full story and the truth about Israel from Israel. It's written in the Holy Bible when David said in Psalm 25:5, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. And God says in Zechariah 8.16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak out the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment to peace in your gates. And always search for the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8.31 I hope you enjoyed the program. God bless you from Jerusalem. Shalom, shalom. Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rome. And I'm Erin Viner. In our top story, the third intifada has begun. According to the IDF Etzion sector commander, Colonel Yaniv Alaluf, we're no longer on the verge of the third intifada. It's already here. While speaking to soldiers assigned to his sector, he said, we anticipate many more clashes from now on. Describing the current situation, he said the peace process, led by Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, is over, replaced by the attitude promoted by Hamas. Abbas is trying to survive the Arab Spring, and he understands that the path of negotiations with Israel is at an end. Official sources in the IDF have disagreed with al Alouf's statement, saying there are as yet no signs of an imminent third intifada. This comes just as the Shin Bet Security Service released its report on the drastic increase in violence at the end of 2012. Aaron Miner has more on that story. Israel's Shin Bet Internal Security Agency has released its report on the situation during 2012, detailing a dramatic increase in terror activity in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem. The agency found that in November there were 166 terror-related incidents and 111 in December. The attacks include the throwing of 98 Molotov cocktails, six attempted bombings, three grenade explosions, two light arm shootings, and one stabbing. There were also numerous riots in Judea and Samaria, during which 20 Israelis were wounded. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned his cabinet that global jihadists are quickly encroaching on the Syrian border with Israel. He proposed the construction of a security fence on the Syrian border to prevent terrorist infiltration and weapons smuggling into Israel. He said, we know that today on the other side of the border with Syria, the Syrian army has moved away, and in its place, global jihadi elements have moved in. Netanyahu noted the instability of the regime of Bashar al-Assad and mentioned the grave threat that Syria's chemical weapons pose to Israel. In a rare address, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad reiterated his belief that the uprising in his country is being led by terrorists and that the West is trying to divide Syria. During his first public speech in more than six months, Assad described the fighting in Syria as a domestic issue and warned that the nation will handle the conflict on its own. The besieged leader then detailed his own preconditions for a peace deal that includes his remaining in power as he pledged to continue deploying troops to battle as long as there is even one terrorist left in Syria. According to opposition forces, such as the Free Syrian Army, the rebels are not terrorists, but resistance fighters, attempting to bring an end to the tyranny of the Assad regime. The United Nations Human Rights Council has estimated that more than 60,000 people have been killed since the Syrian civil war erupted in March of 2011. Iran's foreign minister, Ali Akbar Salehi, came out in support of Assad's statement. A letter posted on the Iranian foreign ministry's website said, the Islamic Republic supports President Assad's proposed initiative for a comprehensive solution to the crisis. Iran has supported Assad, especially since the uprising began. Tehran has been supplying Syria with weapons, training, and even the notorious Revolutionary Guard has been on the ground fighting alongside the Syrian army against opposition forces. U.S. viewership of the pan-Arab Al Jazeera news channel has increased ninefold following the Qatar-owned network's purchase of current TV owned by former Senator Al Gore. Al Jazeera will now reach some 40 million homes in the United States. 
Watchdog organizations have voiced concern over the deal, saying that Al Jazeera has a troubling record of providing a platform to all manner of virulent, anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic extremists and serving as a propaganda tool against the state of Israel. In response to the acquisition, the second largest television operator in the United States, Time Warner, has dropped Current TV. The company released a statement announcing the termination of its agreement, saying that the removal of the service will be carried out as quickly as possible. The Hamas terrorist organization has banned all Israeli media from the Gaza Strip. Hamas has controlled the densely populated area since 2007, when Hamas staged a bloody coup and forced Fatah out of Gaza. The general population is indoctrinated with terrorist rhetoric, and this recent move of banning Israeli media is seen by Israel as just another step in controlling the people of Gaza. The United States has deported an Iranian businessman for illegally exporting goods to the Islamic Republic that could be used to enrich uranium. Amir Hossein Sairafi was sentenced to more than three years in prison back in 2010 after he pled guilty to money laundering, conspiracy, and violating the 1995 trade embargo against Tehran. The Iranian national was accused of shipping vacuum pump equipment through the United Arab Emirates to the hardline Islamic Republic. Egyptian media has released archived video footage of Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi in an anti-Semitic rant. When Morsi was the spokesman for the Muslim Brotherhood Party in 2010, he called Israelis Zionist bloodsuckers and warmongers. He said that Jews must not be given any opportunity and must not stand on any Islamic or Arab land. They must be driven out of our countries. He went on to call on all Muslims to support terrorism and employ all forms of resistance against Israel. He said resistance is the only way to liberate the land. In a separate interview, Morsi debunked the myth of a two-state solution, saying the Zionists have no right to the land. There is no place for them on this land. By no means do we recognize the Green Line. He said we want a country for the Palestinians on the entire land of Palestine. All the talk about a two-state solution and about peace is nothing but an illusion. He rebuked negotiations with Israel by saying, ties of all kinds must be severed with this entity. The Arab people must boycott this entity and avoid normalizing relations with it. Imprisoned Fatah terrorist leader Marwan Barghouti is calling on Palestinians to launch a revolution. The 53-year-old convict is serving five life terms in prison for his role in terrorist attacks in Israel during the Second Intifada. In a statement published by his attorney to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Fatah's first armed attack against Israel, Barghouti wrote that peace talks, negotiations, and United Nations bids are a waste of time and what is needed instead is a battle on the ground to end the occupation and solidify the Palestinian state. He added that a true Palestinian state can only be achieved through the resistance and sacrifice of Palestinians and not by going through the diplomatic route through New York. Saying that peace negotiations have completely failed, Barghouti condemned leaders who pursue peace talks as losers who are misleading their people. An Israeli company is designing the largest desalination facility in the Western Hemisphere. IDE Technologies has contracted to build an enormous water purification plant in the San Diego area. Construction of the project will begin this year with the goal of bringing high-quality drinking water to the San Diego area by 2016. Avshalom Felber, CEO of IDE Technologies, said we believe that the Carlsbad desalination project will set the stage for the future of desalination in America. He added that for decades we've successfully completed similar projects in countries all over the world, and we're excited to be a part of what will be the largest desalination plant in the United States. Israel's chief rabbis are applauding efforts of the Efrat organization to save babies. Rabbis Shlomo Amar and Yonah Metzger sent a letter to clerics and religious councils throughout Israel pointing out that during its 30 years of operation, tens of thousands of fetuses have been saved thanks to the association, including at least 4,000 over the past year alone. Saying that the State of Israel considers children to be its greatest natural resource, the nation's leading religious figures encouraged all rabbis in Israel to distribute materials from Efrat and to include the organization's chairman, Eli Shoshim, at their conferences.
And that concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. And Baruch Hashem, thank God, we got rained out of our rooftop studio here in Jerusalem. My guest today is Susanna Kokanen, director of Christian Friends of Yad Vashem. Susanna, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Susanna, tell us a little bit about what is Yad Vashem. Yad Vashem is the Holocaust Memorial and Education Center in Jerusalem, Israel. It was founded in 1953, so only a few short years after World War II ended. And the words Yad Vashem come from the Bible, from the book of Isaiah 56 and 5, to them I will give within my house and my walls a memorial and a name. So a memorial and a name, name of course referring to the six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust, of whose names about <clears throat> four million have been collected. It's interesting, you have Christian Yad Vashem, friends of, Christian friends of Yad Vashem. Why did you think it's important that Christians should take part in the memorial of Jews from the Holocaust? You know, for a long time, there was a very common belief that somehow the Holocaust was just part of Jewish history. And then in the 1990s, we have movies like Schindler's List that come out and change that perception. And a lot of Christians became interested. They wanted to understand how is it part of our history too. And when we think about anti-Semitism, the 2,000 years of history and how Christians were complicit in the persecutions, we understand that it's not only Jewish history. It's something that we as Christians need to study in order to understand our own roots. You know, the, there's a lot of cooperation now between Jews and Christians. How is this uh, organization, Christian Friends of Yad Vashem, how is it used to bring Jews and Christians together? Well, I think our work, it's pioneering and it's building bridges because the Holocaust is the most difficult, the most painful topic in history. And it's a genocide of such proportions that it's really hard to, <clears throat> to understand and to study it. And when we bring Christian leaders to Yad Vashem and they have a program about anti-Semitism, the Holocaust, and then connect it with the state of Israel today, that really opens their eyes to see that there's the history, but there's also the Bible. And we can see how the biblical prophecy relates to the Bible and how we study the Bible, how we teach about the Bible. So Jews and Christians are coming together around this team, but it's opening their eyes to a lot of other things that they can study together. So Susanna, what are some of the things that you're doing in your programming this year? Well, we had the International Christian Leaders Seminar in April um, for Christian leaders coming from around the world. For the first time in Yad Vashem's history, we will also be hosting a seminar for young Christian leaders, again from all over the world in December 2013. We host visitors. We'll be happy to organize uh, programs for pastors who come with groups to Yad Vashem. And of course, around the time of the Yom HaShoah, the Holocaust Memorial Day in April, we have a whole lot of activities. We're seeing an alarming rise of anti-Semitism, especially in Europe, but also in other places around the world. Mm -hmm. How does this affect your work? Well, I think one of the things that is so important for us to teach is that anti-Semitism has changed its face, its clothing many times in history. Um, we have the traditional Christian anti-Semitism. We have the racial anti-Semitism. We have the social and economic theories about the Jews. And today, we are seeing that all of these forms, they somehow exist in different parts of the world. But we also have um, anti-Semitism, which is rather new and calls itself anti-Zionism. It's an attitude about the state of Israel. And so for us, um, when we go out to do outreach programs or we invite these pastors to Yad Vashem, uh, because of this new form of anti-Semitism, it's even more urgent than it was before that people learn about it, that people understand that how do we recognize anti-Semitism? 
How do we talk about it? How can we influence our media as Christians? And how, how should we be standing with the state of Israel today? So this is all very important. It's a part of our program. You know, they, they talk about a lot in uh, the media and also in educational uh, uh, initiatives about how anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. It's the new anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. But some of the things that they don't mention is that traditionally anti-Semitism was rooted in Christianity, but now, today, it's more rooted in radical Islam. How has that difference uh, affected your work? Well, I think um, you are quite right, but I think that um, we are also seeing this very interesting trend whereby some of the churches, they are actually standing very much with this new anti-Semitism. Some of the boycotts and sanctions against Israel, they actually come from the Christian community, from some of the churches. So that's hugely important for me because uh, if we can't get the churches to understand that there is this connection to anti-Semitism when they initiate these things, then it's going to be a very dangerous situation because the Christian support to Israel is vitally important and it can be easily eroded if these ideas enter the church. Susanna, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? I would like to invite Christians worldwide to stand with the state of Israel and to become active partners with Yad Vashem when we stand against the modern anti-Semitism, and this way we are also standing for our biblical beliefs and for the state of Israel. Thank you, Susanna, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. More than one million Jewish children have been killed by abortion in Israel since 1948. Israel is currently engaged in a demographic war for its very survival as a Jewish state. Imagine what a difference one million more Jews would have made for Israel. Friends of Efrat saves the lives of thousands of children every year by providing support to pregnant women in distress. Since 1977, Ifrat has saved over 30,000 lives and is recognized as a world leader in preventing abortions. You can play a major role in Israel's survival now by helping us save Israel's unborn children. Up next, Shining Light from Israel. The dairy industry is as much about cows as it is innovation. And it's here on Kibbutz Afikim, just south of the Sea of Galilee, that the world's best dairy farming technologies are conceived. 25 years ago, a member of the kibbutz named Eli Peles came up with a simple but revolutionary idea. The world's first electronic milk meter. No more wasted time measuring the milk by hand, this innovation showed how many liters of milk has been produced by a cow in real time. The kibbutz dairy company, Afi Milk, quickly became a powerhouse in dairy farm and herd management. The Afi Milk R&D team is constantly updating its technologies. It has created hardware and software to monitor and direct each cow's performance. We want to get as much milk as we possibly can out of each cow. However, the water part of the milk we're not interested in. The water we can add later if we need to. So we need to know the solids of the milk. The solids are what's worth something. The Effie Lab will give you an exact count of the solids in the milk. If you do not know the milk solids, you're feeding the cow blindly. And you're most likely wasting a lot of money. So when the Vietnamese corporation, TH Milk, decided to boost milk consumption in the Asian Republic, it made sense to turn to Afi Milk. The Vietnam Project is considered the largest venture of its kind in the world. 
With a budget of $1.2 billion, Afimilk has been saddled with the challenge of building 12 dairies from scratch. It's a great challenge and a very exciting opportunity for us to be the leaders in this project. We were the best team to deliver the technology transfer that should be done in order to make that people that has never deal, uh, dealt with uh, milk production, they can, you know, handle and manage those large dairy farms. Israeli President Shimon Peres recently paid a state visit to Vietnam and toured the Israeli-built dairy farms. Afi Milk is only a small part of the burgeoning business ties between Israel and Vietnam, but it is probably the component that put Israel on the map for most Vietnamese. Paris even alluded to Afi Milk when he spoke to reporters after a state dinner in Hanoi. The greatest champion we have in Israel is the cow. And by the way, the best milk. <laughs> so we're very glad we started with a milky beginning. It's very promising. Vietnamese President Chiron Tang Seng said that his country is seeking further help from Israel to increase the use of modern agricultural technology and know-how. Afi Milk's computerized milking systems can be found in over 50 countries. In an effort to boost the Palestinian economy, Afi Milk established a farm in the West Bank town of Hebron. Afi Milk officials believe that this type of cooperation contributes to building trust and coexistence. We absolutely love working with Palestinians as well as other less developed markets because we can change lives. We can truly change lives. Back at the cow shed and the dairy workers are calling the cows into their positions. The music coming out of the speakers is to keep the cows in high spirits. After all, a happy cow will produce the most milk. They are very curious and some of them are very funny, they want to play. But they're cute, cute animals. Good girls. Indeed, Israel's four-legged milk manufacturers are moveless superstars. This is Viva Levy Press for Israel Up Close. Please stay tuned for the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Welcome again to ICJ Report and today we have a very special guest with us, Pastor Stephen Khoury, who is directing together with his father, Pastor Naim Khoury, Holy Land Missions, which is an apostolic ministry here in the Holy Land. They have been planting churches over the past decades here in Israel, but also in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. He's a true man of God and it's a privilege for us to have him with us today. Pastor Stephen, tell us about what is the situation in the Middle East in general for Christians, but also in particular here in Israel in the surrounding areas. Dutch Kurgan, we are in a day and age right now where people want to know the true Jesus Christ. People want to know the true message of hope. Um, and what better time for us as believers in Christ, both local Arabs, uh, uh, believers, uh, to be a light for the world in this land. Uh, this is the time more than ever for the Christians around the world to spread the light of Christ, to spread the love of God to all, to all faith, to all people groups, regardless of who they are. You just mentioned me, you, you have been down in Gaza, which of course is a very difficult situation there. Tell us what you are doing there. Well, Dr. Jurgen, I, I want to start out by saying that God putting Gaza on your heart and putting the, the, the suffering believers in Gaza on the heart of the ICEJ leadership 
it speaks volumes because the, the church in Gaza, the believers in Gaza are broken. The believers in Gaza are seeking and searching for someone to stand with them. And it, it's more than just a, a monetary thing, more than just a resource thing. They want somebody just to let them know we are with you, we're standing behind you, more than just words. So therefore we went into Gaza to show this broken church that they are not forgotten. We went into Gaza, uh, we prayed with them, we fed them, we gave them food baskets, we, we did worship and praise and teaching, Bible teaching to show them that they are not forgotten and that we know that they are not the only ones alone. And what I hear that you also established churches in places like Chenin and Hebron and uh, some of the other Arab communities here in the West Bank. We, we have uh, seven active ministries uh, throughout the whole country, both on the Arab side and the Israeli side. Um, my heart right now is Jerusalem. My heart goes out to Jerusalem. Uh, my heart is broken for Jerusalem because I believe it is the epicenter uh, for the world, for the Arabs there. The Arabs listen. The world listens to the Arabs in Jerusalem. So if I can change the hearts and the minds of the people in Jerusalem, then I believe we can change the rest of the Middle Eastern world. The amazing thing is that in the middle of all this chaos and this political turmoil, we hear fantastic reports about revivals taking place in the Middle East today. Places like Iran and even in Egypt. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? There are many revivals happening in the Middle East. You have the church uh, in Iran is, is, is doubling and tripling more than 20%. 200,000 believers are coming to Christ on a regular basis. Uh, you have believers in Egypt as well. Uh, the underground church in Egypt is growing. The believers in, in Egypt are growing to become more bold about what they believe in. And the church in Syria, under what's going on right now, the church in Syria is coming together and uniting all denominational churches that believe in Jesus Christ wow. are coming together to sort of realize that the common enemy is the devil is Satan, not ourselves. And what that's is creating is creating this, this new atmosphere where Christians in the Middle East in general are realizing that time is short, that we must redeem that time. That is something that my father uh, and I have been teaching and preaching on, the, on, on TV, on Salat. We have the privilege to speak to more than 200 million Arabs and Muslims and traditional mm -hmm. Christians around the world to teach these Middle Easterners the concept of who Jesus is and what Jesus wants us to be. And I'm just challenging Christians in the West and Europe to start in imitating the, the faith of the Middle Eastern believers to love Jesus till death. And what a more powerful message to, to have right now where Arabs are coming to Christ. And what a, what, you know, what an opportunity that right now God's given ICAGA to be a part of this. And, and you're taking this miracle and you're taking it to the next level. We're telling the world Arabs are believing in Jesus Christ. Arabs are changing their hearts and the minds. Our Isaiah 62 campaign actually started two years ago because God put it on our heart to pray for the Arab nations and to pray in particular for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit and for a revival here in the Middle East. Please continue standing with us, but also keep in mind that the Arab churches here in the regions, they are caught between the lines and they need your support and your prayers. We are your embassy here in Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you out of Zion. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Yochanan El Rom. And I'm Erin Feiner, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all your Israel updates.